Good morning and welcome to New Horizon Vineyard. Those of you who are in the building and those of you who are worshiping with us online. Um, my name is Betsy and I just welcome you today. Um, I want to wish a happy Father's Day to all the fathers who are present with us and online. And then before we worship our Heavenly Father this morning, I just want to tell you a couple of things. For those of you in the building, um, we are so glad you're here. Um, we do ask that um, while we're worshiping, we're going to keep our masks on and um, just kind of stay in our area. Um, but feel free to participate in worship as freely. And those of you at home, we encourage you to just join and worship with us um, and fellowship with us. Um, we are a praying church. We've always been a praying church. And so during this pandemic, we've worked to continue ways to pray as a church. So at any time, if you're online, um, you can enter a prayer request in the comments. If you're in the room with us, we have connection cards at your seats. And please put a prayer request or a praise report on those cards. We do, um, we do pray for those. Um, also, I just want to let you know, we have a Zoom prayer room set up at the end of the service. And so if you would like prayer for anything, you can pray privately with two prayer ministers via that Zoom link. And so that will be available. Um, you'll see it in the comments at the end of the service. Um, so I'd like to open us with a psalm. And um, hmm. make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness and come before his presence with singing know that the Lord is God and we are his we are his people and the sheep of his pasture enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise be thankful and bless his name for the Lord is good his loving kindness is everlasting and his truth endures to all generations this Father's Day, we thank you for fathering us. Lord, we thank you for the privilege of worshiping you. We thank you that you are not um, confused or divided by the fact that our congregation is in homes all around and also here in this place that we are still together. Oh, Lord, we just lift our hearts to you. We proclaim you worthy of worship. And we say, come, Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. If you feel inclined, if you'd like to stand and worship with us, we invite you to do that.
is devoted. We thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you for your mercy. 
Lord, in a world where so many things are uncertain and so many things are frightening, we thank you yes, that your love is everlasting. Your love is sure. Your love is something we can rely on, that you never change. Thank you, Lord. you never change. Lord, we need now more than ever that Father who knows what's going on and is confident. And so, Lord, we just look to you with that, and we thank you, and we give you praise. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Well, we um, here at New Horizon continue our worship in our acts of giving tithes and offerings. And so if you're present with us and you have um, a tithe or an offering, there's boxes on the sides. So you can just slip them slip in, in the boxes. And if you're listening online, you can go to nhvineyard.com to donate. For those in our church family online, you can donate through our Realm portal. Or um, at any time, you can um, mail to our mailing address, which is on the Facebook page. Um, so I'd like right now to just pray for our offering and then pray also for our sermon. Oh, Father, we joyfully return a portion in honor of you because of all that you've given us. We thank you, Lord. It's like sowing seeds, and we just pray that you would um, use our gifts to you for your kingdom glory, for your kingdom glory. And, Lord, we thank you for Pastor Cliff, and we ask that today you would open our hearts and minds to hear what you have to say through him. May your spirit be upon him, and may your spirit be within us as we listen. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Uh, this is still weird. It's, it's, it's still weird being with uh, the situation. I, I, you know, a lot of people are wearing their mask and, uh, uh, and they're spaced out and uh, it scares me. <laughs> it scares me. I don't like people with masks on. But that's okay. I'm learning to adjust to it. Uh, but no, you're free to keep them on or uh, take them off where you're at your seat now that we're not uh, singing and, and putting particles out into the uh, air. But uh, it is, it is, it's just a new normal, isn't it? Isn't it a new normal that we're adjusting to? So let me ask, Holy Spirit... Please come and guide these words for the benefit of your people. Lord, we don't want to just um, hear a message. You want to be moved to action. In fact, Lord, we want to be transformed. So I ask that these few minutes that you've given me would be meaningful and powerful and that the Spirit of the living God would fill these words with power to transform lives. Because, Lord, we need transformation more now than ever. And so we thank you for this opportunity. We thank you for this opportunity. It's in Christ that we pray. Amen. You know, I, I am noticing one thing, like, if I feel like I want to cough, I feel like everybody's looking at me like, oh, have you got it? And now I want to scratch my nose, but I know I can't do it with my hands, so I have to do it right here because everything's changing, isn't it? So now last week, we were not here. Uh, in fact, Betsy, uh, who's emceeing today, did an incredible job. But last week, Robbie and I were with you in spirit because we were joining online from Charlevoix, Michigan. We were in a summer home that overlooked Lake Charlevoix, and I believe we have maybe a picture at this moment. Uh, that's, that's the porch, and that was one of the days we had a storm come by, and that's the first time I've ever seen the bottom of a rainbow. I mean, it was right there. That's, that's where the rainbow started. I couldn't find the pot of gold. Uh, I was looking for it, but it was out in the water and couldn't get there. 
But it also reminded me, it was such an incredible day. Uh, it reminded me of God's promise. Uh, that's always going to be what I think of when I see the rainbow is God's promise to us that everything's going to work out. That everything's going to be okay. But now last Sunday, when we were having services here, when we were up there, it was a uh, sunny, balmy, 72-degree day. Uh, that's the high of the day was 72, started at about 50, got up to 72. We were suffering for Jesus up there. Uh, we had the windows open and the breeze was blowing across the lake and through the house. And, and now if there was ever a perfect heavenly day, it was last Sunday in Michigan. Yet after listening to Betsy's sermon, even in that place of perfection, I found myself entering into a lamentation. Uh, she did such an incredible job of creating this picture uh, that caused me, even in this setting that was unbelievable, it caused me to start to lament. Now, it wasn't just Betsy's message because I'd been spending a lot of time studying uh, about the purpose of the church and Betsy's message just magnified how far we had fallen short. And I was lamenting that. The church in America, I think, is, okay, in your imagery, if you don't have grandkids or you don't have kids, you may not get this one. But if you have grandkids or kids, you've probably seen the Lego movie. And there's a song in the Lego movie that everything is awesome, and they're all dancing around, but they know everything's not awesome. There's some people are going, no, no, things are not as awesome as you think it is. And I think that's what we know in church. When we go around and we look at church in America, we go, we're all going, oh, this is great, this is great. But we know deep inside something's not quite right. It's not horrible, but it's not awesome either. In fact, a, a person uh, who I love dearly said to me, and, and, and I can't tell you who it is because they didn't want this to be attributed to them, so I'm just keeping it out there nebulous. But they said uh, they equated church today like biting into what you thought was steak and getting tofu. You know, it's not horrible. Oh, okay, I think it's horrible. But for many of you, it's not horrible, but it's not steak. And I believe at this moment in time in history, like never before, we have the opportunity to chart a new course and take advantage of what has been called a tipping point in history. Uh, if you've never read his book, Malcolm Gladwell, read it. It talks about things happening and there's this convergence where at certain points, all of a sudden there's just enough things happening that things shift. And it's not all at one time things were moving and moving and moving, but something happens, and I believe something has happened in our country, in our world, that has changed things to such a point that we are at a place where we can take advantage of this and do something different. This physical pandemic, like the COVID-19 combined with the social pandemic, like the issues of inequality and the races, creates a crisis that opens up opportunity. Most of you don't look at it that way, but that's what a crisis does. It opens up an opportunity for transformation. And as I said in the very beginning of this situation, when we shut the church down, well, we didn't shut the church down. We, we shut down coming to this building. The church has never been shut down and will never be shut down by anything. But when we closed the building, I said, you know, I started feeling a crisis swelling up in me. And I told myself, don't waste a good crisis. And I still tell you today, if you haven't found something being transformed in you through this period, you're wasting a good crisis. Everybody has something that needs to be transformed. And so what I want to look at today is, is what was th this whole idea of what is the ultimate purpose of the church? I believe it's important for us in this time when people are kind of even questioning why I, I haven't gone to the building in a long time. I hadn't been with anybody. Why do we even care about this church? Why do we care about what church is? And I want to remind you as I say this, church is Always, when I say church, I'm talking about people and not a building. As always, when I say church, I am talking about a people, not a building. You don't go to church. Do you hear me? 
Don't ever say, hey, I'm going to church. You do not go to church. You are the church. This building is not the church. I am the church. Turn to somebody near you and say it quietly so don't spew stuff on them. But say, I am the church. At home, I am the church. There is no such thing as a building called the church. And I want to look at a passage in Ephesians 3, 10, and 11 that I think is going to help us understand what is the purpose of the church because Paul couldn't have been more specific. He said... His intent was that now through the church, through the people, not a building, through the people, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms according to his eternal purpose that he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. I think we gloss over that many times. You don't think of the real ramifications. He's saying, this is Paul saying, the ultimate purpose of the church is to live in such a way that God's wisdom and all the other aspects of his glory will be displayed everywhere. Because you can't display it in the heavenly realms if you're not displaying it here. So there's this assumption that what you're doing here is also impacting there. The church's job is to live so that people can see God through them. The church's job, your job, my job, is to live in such a way that people can see God through them. We are not just a sign on the road that says Jesus ahead 15 miles. Don't look at me. Jesus is ahead. Don't, don't, don't take any note of who I am or what I do. I'm just telling you there is a Jesus and he's ahead. That's never what the scripture says. We're actually ambassadors from another kingdom and another king that when they see us, they see that kingdom and they see that king. Okay. You are spread out, but you can say amen. You can... You, you, you can, you, you, or, or you can just look there and go, I don't like what he's saying. That's okay. I don't have a problem. We reveal his manifold wisdom, his multifaceted wisdom, wisdom that is true wisdom versus perceived wisdom that the world lives by. See, we, we present a wisdom that is centered in love but not a love, uh, and, but it's a love that's based in truth. See, we talk about a love that is sacrificial and other-centered, which is true wisdom. A love that seeks to meet others' needs above our own, which is true wisdom. It's a wisdom that looks at the heart and not the appearance. When we live our lives, we should be showing, presenting, letting people see that there is a God because they see him in us being reflected. So let me ask you, another good question would be, well, so how do we live to manifest God's wisdom? Wouldn't that be a good question? If, in fact, our goal is to manifest his wisdom by the way we live, how do we live in order to do that? Well, the biblical answer might surprise you because we downplay this quite a bit in the evangelical community. The answer found again and again in the New Testament is that we manifest this wisdom through our good deeds. I hardly hear anybody talking about good deeds anymore. It's like, well, you know, in fact... It's not good deeds to get something, but it's good deeds from something. Not to get God's love, but it's birthed out of God's love. And in fact, Jesus said in Matthew 5, 16, in the, that, now listen to these words because sometimes we just miss them. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see What? Your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Our deeds manifest the wisdom of God and they bring him glory. 
Ephesians 2.10 says, For we are God's handiwork. We are his craftsmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do what? Good works that God prepared in advance for us to do. He said, I made you. I created you. I have put this church, the people of God, on this earth in order to do good works that will manifest my wisdom and glory to the heavenly realms and to everywhere they go. God made us to do good deeds. We exist as Christians for that purpose. This is what Titus, uh, and I I don't know about you, I don't read Titus very often, but in my research, Titus came up, 2.14. Paul teaches that Jesus gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. Many of them says zealous for good deeds. A lot of translations say zealous for good deeds. How could he have put it any stronger? What amazes me, and, I, and, and I'm, look, I'm as guilty as all of us, so when I say these things, I'm saying them to myself too. So if you're out there hearing me say this, know that I'm trying to live this out myself. But I'm amazed that people tell me that their actions or deeds don't matter anymore because I am saved by grace through the cross of Jesus. Have you ever said that? I've said it because we get kind of confused with this whole idea. It's a partial truth that's amazingly wrong. It's a partial truth that's amazingly so wrong. Our deeds will never save us, but our deeds will testify to our salvation. No deeds should make us question whether salvation has truly come into our life because those things testify. It's the wisdom of God being manifested. Does that make sense? Is, is this, is this, is this got anything in it? I, I'm, 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 James says as much in James 2, 14 to 26, and I'm not going to put all of that up there. I'm going to read you some of that, and I just want you to listen to it because I think it's going to also tell us kind of what good deeds are. Because you ought to ask, what are these good deeds? Well, James 2, 14 says, What good is it, my brothers, if a man claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save him? Here's a good deed. Suppose a brother or sister is without clothing and daily food, and if one of you says to him, Go, I wish you well, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about his physical needs. What good is it? What, what good is it? This is it's not rocket science. He's saying, hey, somebody came to you and they were hurting and you, you prayed for them. Let me pray for you, but do nothing. He says, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by what I do. You believe that there is one God? Good. Even the demons believe that, and they shudder. He's saying, just because you say it doesn't really make it that big of a deal unless you're doing something about it. (laughs) It only gets worse. You foolish man, do you want evidence That faith without deeds is useless? Was not our ancestor Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and his actions were working together and his faith was made complete by what he did. And the scripture was fulfilled that says Abraham believed God and was credited to him as righteousness and he was called God's friend. You see that a person is justified by what he does and not by faith alone. In the same way, was not Rahab the prostitute considered righteous for what she did when she gave lodging to the spies and sent them off in a different direction? As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. 
no works, no faith, over and over and over. When somebody has a need and we pray and do nothing, that's not a good sign. But how many of you, in fact, what's happening, we live in a culture now that is much more comfortable calling us on our stuff. When, this, when, when some of these catastrophes have happened, I have heard on the radio people say, stop telling me you'll pray for me. Do something. I've heard them. They're going, I don't need your prayers. I need your actions. Well, we know prayer makes a difference, but if all we do is say we'll pray for you and we do nothing, it is meaningless to them and it's meaningless for us. I... I I think we have an opportunity to be different now. When God asks of us something, like he did Abraham, that goes against every fiber of our being and his, and we do it, guess what that is? It's a good sign. It's a good sign when God says, hey, I put you on this earth to show my wisdom and to manifest my glory. And here's a way you can do it. So do this. And when you do it, all of a sudden, his glory is manifested. And people see his wisdom. But when you don't, it's not a good sign. When you put yourself at risk for the sake of another kingdom and another king, like Rahab did, guess what? That's a good sign. Have we truly come to understand the manifest wisdom of God poured out through Jesus Christ? That's a question you ought to ask yourself. Have we truly come to understand? Have we been captured by the love of Christ so powerfully that it spills out over everyone around us through our good deeds? quiet in here. I, this, is, this, is, this is what I think is the crux of what's happening now. God will never abandon his church. Let me, let me set it straight. He will never abandon his church, but he will use certain things in order to transform his church back to what he wanted them to be. And I believe he's using this pandemic to show us that this whole stuff about buildings and about worship services and about everything that we were focusing on that was the big part of what church was doing and people were saying, I'm going to church and that was their good deed as they got up and went to worship. That's not the good deed he's looking for. It's part of it, but it's not it. The good deed is when somebody is hurting and you do something, when there's a thing asked of you and it's difficult and you say, yes, Lord, I will do it because when you do that stuff, his wisdom is manifested. When you see somebody in need and you know you don't have the resources to do it, but you have enough resources to help them, but then it's going to put you in a situation where you're going to have to trust him, when you say, I will help you, guess what happens? You don't know what you're helping them is going to do in their life to manifest this wisdom, but you also don't know what he's going to do in your life to fill that stuff. And you gave him the opportunity to show his wisdom, to show his glory. But when you say, I'll pray for you, but you do nothing, you give nothing to them to show his glory, and you get nothing in your life to show his glory. Don't we want to be a part of a church that sees his glory manifested? That when people see us, they go, wow, I am impressed. I may not agree with you, but I see in you something that is causing me to think. Hebrews 12, 2 tells us that Jesus endured the cross for the joy set before him. What was that joy? Well, it says he was able to feel that the pain was worth it because he could foresee the joy that would come from of it. Guess what I think some of that joy is? Part of that joy for Jesus today is looking down and seeing local churches like New Horizon Vineyard, its people being zealous, eager, hungry to do good deeds. 
When a local church is busy thinking up creative ways to do good to people, then Jesus has not died in vain and the wisdom of God is being displayed. Our wisdom will look different than the wisdom of the world. Our good deeds are judged by a different yardstick. I saw a documentary last week, and it's an incredible documentary. It's about Warren Buffett. Go look it up. Netflix, I think it was on Netflix or somebody, but it was a documentary on him. Think of this. He gave $37 billion of his wealth, which was said to be, it, by the world to be the single most significant donation ever made in history. In history. Jesus would say, now, that was a good one, but that widow, when she gave that might, she was giving out of lack, he was giving out of abundance, and the only one who noticed it was Jesus, and that's the only one who mattered. But that's a good deed. It's not about the sizes. It's that you took time to do an action in obedience to what God is calling you to do, and his glory was manifested. I believe when we're all gathered around that glorious throne and, and Jesus is on there ruling and reigning, because Warren Buffett gave $37 million, it does not mean he bought a seat up front. <laughs> that widow, she's going to be up front, but Warren's probably going to be somewhere back in the cheap seats with me. Do you see the difference? This social pandemic about the inequality between blacks and whites could easily have been avoided if the church of Jesus Christ had stepped up and done the good deeds of seeking the welfare of others above themselves. Where we are today didn't have to be. But we didn't leave. We didn't take the risk. If we had stood up at any moment in history and said, we are better together and made one church instead of the white church and the black church, each learning from one another, each listening to one another, things would be different. But we didn't do it. We didn't take the risk. If we had, the world would be looking to us as something to shout about instead of us being a significant part of the problem. Because there is nowhere in the world any more segregation than the Church of Jesus Christ in America. So what I'm asking you to do it's just to take time and ask yourself, are there deeds that I'm willing to entertain, willing to do, that would actually be something that a person would look out and, and say, there must be a God because what he's doing doesn't make sense in this world. But I see the wisdom of it being manifested and it points to something beyond me. I think we have an opportunity. Don't waste it. Please, do not allow us to go back to the way we were. I'm praying that this pandemic never ends until we get it. Now, do I want it to end? <laughs> yeah, I want it to end yesterday. Uh, in fact, some of the stuff is moving towards where we may have to shut down again. But here's the thing. While we're in it, let this be something that causes you to think, causes you to, to take time to ask these tough questions so that when we come out of this, we will be a stronger, more powerful church actually doing the things we were created to do. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let me pray. Father, you chose to use us to bring you glory. May we take you up on it. May we actually start to do good deeds, not because we're trying to get something from you, but because of what we've already gotten from you, your love and acceptance. And I pray that people will start to look at the church of Jesus Christ, the people of God, and start to give glory to him because of what's being manifested in their lives. 
including all of us in this room and all of us watching online. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you for worshiping with us today. It's been an honor. 
Um, a reminder that the Zoom prayer room is open. So if you'd like prayer for anything, just um, if you're online, click that link. If you're present with us and would like um, prayer, come and talk to one of them right over here. Okay. So, um, yeah, we have some people in there. We've figured out a way to do that socially distance. Um, Father, we thank you for this time together. Um, and I'm going to just end with what my childhood church always ended with. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. And so for those of you in the congregation,